morning church. Our teaching text is from uh, Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7, but I've been moved to read from verse 5. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. This is the word of God. Uh, good morning, church. How are you all doing today? To the one person who said good morning, <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so the question of the day is, of course, as always, linked to the, the message for us, our message this morning. Um, and one of the things that sort of led us to asking that question um, is linked to the fact that we're going to be talking about God as judge. So we have a couple of legal folks um, in, in our church. So if you ever have legal troubles, please feel free to speak to a radio so and they'll direct you to the relevant person. So if you ever find yourself in a situation like this, so I was in, um, and you needed help. But you find yourself in front of a judge, typically because there is some sort of offense that you have, you have made, um, some sort of trespass. And so as we think about a question like that, we had some smaller things, some lighter things, but the question and the conversation around being guilty before God is one that can be very difficult for us as Christians. We often talk about every other sweet, kind, uh, soft and warm quality of God. But judgment before God is the most difficult for us. And I ask that you brace yourself this morning, that you say a short little prayer and ask the Lord to speak to you this morning. As we have this conversation around God as judge. We praise the Lord that He's a gracious, a gracious judge, but He is a judge. He is a God of holiness and righteousness. He doesn't stand for sin. And in our story this morning, we'll be looking at the quality of God um, and seeing the relationship between His grace and His justice. So we're currently in a series um, called I Am. Who I am. There's a beautiful artwork there. I think it's a slide before that. Um, I am who I am at the top there. Last week we looked at Yahweh as our God. So Exodus chapter 3, um, Reno was looking at the fact that after God saved the people of Israel um, from the hands of the Egyptians, parted the Red Sea, they walked through, miraculously they saw the powerful hand of God, the Egyptian soldiers tried to walk through and follow them, the waters came in, and they were delivered and they were saved. They received a moment where, before all of that happened, God had spoken to Moses to say, When I send you out, reveal yourself as I am. Reveal, reveal, reveal me to the people as I am. Yahweh. And so this series, we're looking at the different qualities of God. Last week, we heard the name of God. Yahweh. In other church denominations, it's Jehovah. This week, we're looking at God as gracious. So, as we look at our text, you would see that we're looking at specifically Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. But before we get into, before you actually get into verses 6 and 7, you would see in Exodus chapter 34, verse 1, this is what is said. It says, The Lord said to Moses, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Right, so, so whenever you read the Bible, you think of the Bible, you need to think about the Bible as like, it's a set of narratives. Um, so it's almost like your favorite show on Netflix, Show Max, SABC, where it always starts with, previously, this happened, on the previous episode. So just a quick context, I want us to look at what previously happened in the preceding chapters to chapter 34, which is where we, we find our text situated. So in, in Exodus chapter 32, we see the story of the golden calf. So the people of God uh, uh, became, became restless. They, 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 they did not want to wait for Moses to come down with more commands from God, and they decided to build a calf for themselves. 
If you, if you rewind back a few chapters to Exodus chapter 20, the reason there was a problem is because God revealed Himself and He gave the Ten Commandments and the subsequent Mosaic laws. In the Ten Commandments, the first two was, you shall have no other gods before me. The second one, you shall not make an image for yourself. And worship that image. So in Exodus chapter 32, the people of God are disobeying the first two commandments. Moses gave them the commandments, he went up to the mountain for another 40 days, and they couldn't wait 40 days. In, in, in Exodus 32, it says that the people saw that Moses was not coming down. They gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So they tried to justify it, we don't know what happened to him. So therefore, let's, let's, build a, let's build a golden calf. So, when God sent Moses back down and responded in anger, they had committed a sin. They were guilty before God. That's the context of Exodus 3. Right? As we look at God describe himself the way he does in these verses, it's coming from a couple of events where Further on in verse 30, in chapter 32, God goes on in verse 10 to say, Now leave me alone, saying to Moses, so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Moses had to plead and intercede on behalf of the people of God and say, Lord, wait, before you destroy them, have grace. And so we find ourselves in Exodus 34. The title of our message is Yahweh is our gracious judge. Three points we're going to be looking at this morning as we dive deep and understand the qualities of God in light of this. Uh, the first one is God is king, Lord giver and judge. The second one is God is gracious and loving. And the third thing that we'll end on, the hard one, God does not leave the guilty and punish. <coughs> Let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you this day to, to thank you for, for the gift of your word. Thank you that it's through your word that you revealed yourself to us. You revealed your character to us. And so this morning, Lord, as, as we look at a few of your qualities in our chosen passage, Lord, as we look at this topic that says, Yahweh is our gracious judge, prepare our hearts. At an individual level and at a church capacity, speak to us. Let us know what you want to say to us. May we soften up our hearts to hear from you. May you speak through me this morning. Let me teach your word clearly, you, Father. Let me teach about you, your, your character, and how you operate. In a manner that we can understand that you're Bless our time together. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so this is going to be one of those where we, we do have a couple of uh, things we look at in detail. So we may just have to bear with us this morning. Our first point as we get into it, it says, God is King, Lawgiver, and Judge. In Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, it, it, it articulates this very well. Describing the qualities of God. And we're going to put it up for you right now in a moment. It speaks about God then being king, lawgiver, and judge. See if we can get that passage up there. Isaiah 33 verse 22, For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. So the, the, the reason before we get into looking more at God as gracious judge, we want to, make, we want to take a moment to, to sort of confirm, dare I say, we confirm God's standing, his authority, and his credibility, his legitimacy as our God, King, as, as our King, Lord, Giver, and Judge. So if we go back to Exodus chapter 20, we're not going to put it up there for you guys, but I want to read. In Exodus 20, this is where God gives the Ten Commandments. And as he gives the Ten Commandments, theologians and scholars recognize that he uses a form in presenting the Ten Commandments that confirms his legitimacy as King. They, they, they call this the contemporary royal treaties 
All that means is a treaty is, is, is an agreement between two parties. So it's, it's a covenant of God. So within this context, so, so back in the day when a king would present themselves to the people, the people of their kingdom, they would present themselves in the following form as we see in Exodus 20. So first of all, they give a preamble in which the great king identifies himself. So here we see God say, I am the Lord your God in Exodus 20 verse 2. The second thing is that it's a historical prologue in which he sketched his previous gracious acts towards the subject and the people. Here we see God saying, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And the third and final thing then, it's the treaty, the covenant stipulations, which are to be obeyed. So the king establishes who they are, their king. So God is our Lord, our master, Yahweh. They tell us what they did. So God says, I freed you out of slavery. I delivered you miraculously. And so thirdly, I will then give you my stipulations. I will give you the, 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 the laws that govern how you are to live as the people of God. And so as king, as lawgiver, and as judge, he will hold us accountable based on the stipulations and the regulations he gave us. Right? As we understand it. Now, looking, looking a little bit further at an understanding of what the, 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 the Hebrew word for judge means, um, the word is shafat. And it means to pronounce a sentence. So a judge will pronounce a sentence, they will execute a judgment, and by implication, they will vindicate or punish an individual. We understand the important role of a judge because in, in, in our land, in South Africa, we've recently been going through a process where um, we're interviewing a prospective chief justice candidate. And the role of a chief justice then is they protect the constitution. As I said, my wife is a lawyer, she's in child rights law, and so, this is a constitution, a copy of a constitution. I have a friend and business partner who's also in the law and he has a copy of the constitution. Shami, I'm sure right now in the house you have a copy of the constitution somewhere, eh? So the reason lawyers have a copy of the constitution, a personal copy, is because the entire field revolves around the constitution, which is, how do you guys define it, the sup supreme uh, law of the land. That's the constitution. So everything must, must, must be held to the standard of the Constitution. And so a judge will then make a determination based on the laws that they have given in the land. So there's a, there's, there's, there, there was a Chief Justice, uh, an international Chief Justice from Australia, who wrote a letter to incoming judges. And this is how he described the importance of being a judge. So again, we're understanding judge within the context of our modern day context to then further understand judge within the context of the scriptures. So this Chief Justice writing a letter to incoming judges says, a judge's role is to serve the community in the pivotal role of administering justice according to the law, presiding over and hearing the matter at hand, interpreting the law, and handing down judgments. I did a little exercise to to understand a little bit further the important role of the law as it relates to citizens, being citizens, or being uh, individuals who, who preside in a particular land. And I asked a couple of questions to, to some of the people that I do know who are in the, in the legal system, and the question that I chose to ask that I'm going to share with you some of the results, it says, what would you say the law represents in society? And this is what some of them had to say. Sometimes it represents a tool that protects against previous past injustices, and other times it symbolizes a promise for the protection that is slow. So you see the word injustice coming in there. Depending on where you are and where you stand in community, the law may represent freedom or a yoke that pulls you down. The law is supposed to represent a candle that leads to the society living in harmony. It has the potential to be used to silence the downtrodden. You know, it's, it's, it's profound as we think about what the law can mean. Last one that I want to share. They said people disagree on many things. The law provides an authoritative framework for ordering society and regulating transactions in order to minimize disagreements. Well, just to, to, to mention some. The reason I, I chose to read that is because after God gave the Ten Commandments, He gave the rest of the laws, what they call the Mosaic laws from chapter 21 to chapter 34. In those laws like what happens if you harm your neighbor but you don't kill them? This is the consequence. What happens if you harm your neighbor and you kill them? This is the consequence. What happens if you injure your neighbor's livestock? 
This is what happened. So, so at a practical level, these laws were to, that God gave to his people were to help them live in accordance with one another and in reference to God. Right? So it's a, it's a horizontal and it's a vertical. So when we see God as judge, it's within the context of us amongst one another and then ultimately us with God. And so we are come to God at the end of the day. The Bible teach, teaches us consistently from Old Testament to New Testament that we will account to God. And by the way, this isn't a foreign construct for many of us, right? Because we live in, a, in an accounting society. So a husband and a wife must account to one another. I must say to my wife how I spent the resources we said we were going to spend. A parent wants accounting from a child. To tell them how they managed the resources they were given, how they obeyed the rules that they were given in the house, how they fulfilled their chores. So a child is always accounting. Employees, as was mentioned earlier today, account to their employer. They pay you, so you must account for how you fulfilled and managed your time. And lastly, state and its citizenry. We had the state of the nation the other day where the president is obliged obligated to give us a breakdown, an analysis, an assessment of what's happened to we the people that put him in power. We the people must account to the state on how we pay our taxes, whether we do or we don't. So church, I, I want us to, to recognize that this, this concept of accounting is not foreign to us. So when we hear the Bible say we must account to God, we shouldn't be surprised. God is our creator. King, Lord giver, judge. It shouldn't be a surprise, church, that we hear that we will have to account. I want to share a few verses that highlight this. We'll be looking at Romans chapter 14, verses 10 to 12. And it says, For we will all stand before God's judgment seat, as it is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, also the similar reading, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We will all face God as our judge. Whether it's today, whether it's this year, whether it's at the end of our time. What are we expected to do in light of understanding that he's a God who is judge? He's a God who's king, he's a God who's your king. So as we get into our second, so the first one was just to establish that God is king, he's lawgiver, he's judge. He's our creator in Genesis 1, it says. So whenever there was any doubt or, or, or confusion around, should I account to God? I don't recognize God as my authority. You know in the political landscape where they say I don't recognize the leader? Whether you like it or not, you're going to have to recognize God. <laughs> but the Bible tells us, it is written, every knee will bow before him. Okay, so we're together, eh? we, we have established God's standing as king, Lord, you and judge. Okay, second point then that we'll look at is, God is gracious and he's loving. God is gracious and he's loving. And this is, this is sort of, these are the qualities of God that we often talk about in the, in the church, and I won't spend too much time on it, but I will spend a bit of time on it because it might be those of us in the church who are hearing about God's goodness for the first time. We're hearing about His graciousness and His love. So as we look at verses 6 and 7, it speaks to some of God's qualities. Let's read them together. As He passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, so this is God talking about Himself. He says, the Lord, the Lord, so Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to the thousands, and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. It's a beautiful words. It's a beautiful, powerful words to hear. And before we get to the gut wrenching, yet he does not leave the guilt and punish. I'm going to pretend. I'm going to ask you to pretend you can't see that part. But the first part of it, then, let's let's look at God and His graciousness. 
Right? So some of these qualities that I mentioned, it says he's, he's a compassionate God. In another version it says he's merciful. It says he's, he's, he's a gracious God. He, he's one, one scholar says he's one who's not moved by necessarily the emotions, but it, 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 it's action driven. He gives to those who don't deserve it. That's grace. He's a gracious God. He's slow to anger. Anger that leads to destruction. I'm going to read a few verses that show us that. The Bible says he's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The love that's used there is, 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 is a covenant kind of love. We know the covenant kind of love is not based on emotion or romanticism. It's based on commitment. Covenant. That's the, God that, that's the love that God is describing here. So his love for us, regardless of what happens, what we do, he will still love us. Faithfulness and in maintaining love to the thousands. He's a forgiving God. Jesus was asked, how many times do we forgive those who sin against us? He says, 70 times sin. Symbolizing it's an infinite amount of forgiveness. And so, the, the, the word we see here for forgiveness is, is in the Hebrew word, is to, is to pick up and carry. So, when I'm guilty, I, I have my sin that is before me. And the word that, that says God forgives us, He picks up that load and carries it so we don't have to carry it. That's the word of forgiveness that's used here. That's the kind of God we serve. So, in Exodus 34, God is describing himself this way, but that's because all of these qualities that we see, he displayed to the people of Israel in previously. This is what happened, right? So in the preceding chapters, in chapter 32, the Bible tells us that they committed the sin, they, they disrespected God, God heard about it. 32 verse 10 it says, Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them. So he chose to be slow to anger because he could have immediately been angry and taken an action. He asked Moses, leave me so I can simmer in my anger and take action. So he took time in his anger towards the people of God here in, in Exodus 32. He allowed Moses, in verse 11 it says, but Moses sought the favor of the Lord. He allowed Moses graciously to plead the case for the people. Moses kept going and he gave his rhetoric and he, 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 he spoke on behalf of the people and, and, and God said it's okay. In verse 14, then the Lord relented and said, and he did not bring on the people the disaster he had threatened. So he looked over what they had committed. Right? So as we see these qualities of God in, in, in Exodus 34, verse 6 and 7, we see that God is not talking abstractly. In real time, he's talking about what graciousness and, and his faithfulness towards his people. But just because God is gracious and loving doesn't mean he's not slow to action. As we'll see in the next verse. In verse 7, yet he does not leave the guilty and punished. You know, I remember when I read this for the first time, or I read this again a few weeks ago, I was like, yo. He, he doesn't. Yo. He doesn't leave the guilty and punished. And then I thought about yesterday and why I did it. So now my confession is once in a while I'll go above the speed limit and I'll ask Jesus to forgive me every time. So that's my public confession. Hold me accountable. So I know myself. <laughs> I recognize that regularly there are sins I commit. Hey. And then I read this verse. And then I'll go back to the New Testament that talks about the fact that my sins have been forgiven and, and, and Jesus is the Lamb. And he... But then, again, I see that he says he doesn't leave the guilty and punished. That's the, the wrestle I'm sure that many of us feel as well and felt as we read this verse. We see here that God then actually, in Exodus 32, 
he wiped out 3,000 of those that were involved in the golden calf incident. He wiped out 3,000. So he chose not to destroy everyone, but seemingly there are those who chose to stay in a rebellious state. And the Bible tells us that God does not leave the guilty unpunished. So as, as we further understand this, let me use, I think, maybe a relatable example. Parenting. All the parents in the house, can you please raise your hands? All the parents in the house. Church, can you pray for these folks with their hands? It's rough being a parent. <laughs> I say this looking on from a distance. It's hard. So, can we pray for you, church? The parents, no? <laughs> but there are a lot of things we can learn from the parental relationship. Um, just because parents love their kids doesn't mean they don't discipline them if they have to. Correct, parents? Okay. I, I, I was, I was a self-appointed researcher this week. So first of all, I did some research asking some lawyers and those in the legal field and the church some questions. And then I asked some of the parents. And I'm going to read some of your responses, but I won't tell the church who said what. Lest you feel judged. Well, that's the read what some of our parents said to a question I asked. So the question I asked, I said, as a parent, what is the importance of discipline and disciplining your children? I didn't get a chance to ask everyone, but I was able to ask a few folks. And I'm going to read some of the answers that they said. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, no, just for whistle. So I want to read some of the, the responses from us. So this is us. This is our, this is what, these are those of us in the church. Now our church. One says, it's, it's, so, so again, the question is, as a parent, what is the importance of discipline and disciplining your children? One said, it's loving your kids. That's why we discipline them. We show them the right way so they don't have to learn the hard way the consequences. Like jumping on the bed has consequences. You break your finger, you break your lip, you break your toe. But love means showing you the way and disciplining you so that you learn without having to face the consequences. Another parent said, discipline creates character, integrity, honesty. Respectful behavior, being trustworthy, even good decision making. Teachers, not just knowing what the right thing is to do, but also how and when to do the right thing. Us as parents, we're given the responsibility and opportunity to be able to discipline our children. The outcome of doing that is our obedience to God and obedient, responsible children. The other side of not disciplining your children is chaos. Calls from the school, embarrassment, disobedience, trust issues. Distance in a relationship between parent and child, but also distance between you and God. Another parent said, I don't think there's a quick answer. First of all, it's a way we love and serve our daughters. We discipline them to show them that we have their interests at heart. They're being disciplined because they chose disobedience, and this has consequences. We teach or reinforce boundaries. These are super important for kids. And then we reinforce God's commands and ways of living life. All discipline is preceded with words such as you are loved, accepted, regardless of what you have or what you choose, as well as it would have ended the same way. Another one said, what a fun question. I'll counter that by asking, what's the purpose of having children in the first place? And whatever the person answers to that question, I can almost guarantee failing to discipline your children will result in that purpose being lost. I'm going to read just two more. Regarding discipline, I think it's very important as it's a way to ensure they understand what is acceptable behavior and what is not. As a parent, you have an opportunity to discipline your children in a safe and a loving way. If you neglect the duty, somebody else or society or force acceptable behavior on them, or failing that, remove them, which is not loving. All that is said within a backdrop of discipline being executed in a loving manner. Last one, most importantly, discipline should lead them to love their neighbor, more and more and become less self-centered in their hearts, and more loving outwardly. In our house, we apply discipline through a naughty corner, removing stars from the charts on the public wall, taking away toys and creating a space through discussion so that they can reflect on their behavior and actions and come out a more refined person. Thank you for bearing with those. So, those were the responses from parents in the church. The understanding of what discipline is. Let's read the scriptures quickly. See what they have to say on this topic. Oh yeah, right off the front, of course. Okay. Hebrews 12, verse 5 to 11. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son... Do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, 
and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as you endure discipline. God is treating you as children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more would you submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained in it. So, I think our parents deserve a round of applause in the church. Right? Um, because you'll see what the scriptures say, and you'll listen to what some of our parents said, and it's raising your kids through love, first and foremost. Every parent that I asked spoke about the fact that when you discipline, it is rooted in love, and the children know that they loved. And then it speaks about the corrective nature of discipline. This is what the scriptures say about God. God is our Father. So as we, as we read this passage, the reason I wanted to share a little bit about and link it to parenting and, and discipline, we're going to look at a few words now. We understand that even when gave God the, when God gave the laws that He gave us, every consequence, every repercussion was corrective in nature. Was to ensure we conducted ourselves in a godly, holy manner, so we live well with one another and we live well with God. So we honor the, the image of God in my sister and my brother, and we honor God as our Lord and as our Savior. So, it's important to understand the law and the laws of God. So that when we do encounter judgment, discipline, God standing in position of king and lawgiver, we understand that it's, it's from one who loves. And he does what he does because he believes it's what's best for us as, as, as parents with him. So, so let, me, let, me, let me look at a few Deeper definitions of the word discipline. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew, in the Greek, in Hebrews 12, when it talks about verse 6, there's a, it uses the word discipline and then it uses the word punish. So the word discipline means to train or to educate. It has the definition of dis, disciplinary correction. So it's linked to train up a child. To discipline by punishment is one of the definitions within the word discipline. Proverbs 22 verse 6, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're older, they won't turn, they won't turn away from it. So the word discipline is similar to train up. So the word discipline has in it this understanding of instruction, correction, punishment. I think we might have Psalm 94 verse 12. I'm not sure if we have it. We might have it up there. We do have, oh, we don't have Psalm 94. Okay, that's fine. Psalm 94, let me read it for us, I do have it here. It also speaks in a little bit more detail. So Psalm 94 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man you discipline, O Lord, that man you may teach from your law. Right, so God corrects and he teaches in accordance with his law. So as a judge, his reference point is always his law. It's always the word of God. So that word there for discipline means to instruct, to correct, to punish. Psalm 94 verse 10, so a few verses before that it says, Does he who discipline nations not punish? The word punish there has the definition rebuke, correct, reprove. Rebuke, correct, reprove. That might sound a bit familiar to some of us. So in 2 Timothy, Chapter, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the words correct, rebuke, reprove are also used there. It says, 
I want to read it, so I, I, I relatively know it, I can paraphrase it, but I want to read it correctly. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-inspired and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. So, if the Bible definition for the word discipline and punishment can say reprove, re rebuke, correct, and the Bible dis defines the word of God as God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training into righteousness, do we see the critical role of discipline and reprove, punish? I'm still uncomfortable using the word punish, but it's. It's a word that's used in the Bible, right? For God, the objective is always correct. As with a loving parent, the objective is to steer your child. Someone said, like, if a child is about to touch a fire, uh, as a parent, you, you're not ashamed of pulling them away and rebuking them because you're protecting them. We get it, right? That's the God we serve. And though sometimes we may not understand how he operates, why he does what he does, what he actually does, the foundation is that he's a loving and gracious God. And he wants what's best for us. As we draw a message to a close, let's have a look at our teaching text one more time. As we look at verse 7. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. I was going to give us a sort of a, a deep definition of each of the words guilty and punished and punish, but I don't think we have to for the purposes of moving. I think it's clear. So God said he won't leave the guilty unpunished. God is not just a God of speech, he's a God of action. He holds to what he says. So again, remember I told you that this passage, Exodus 34, God is describing what he did previously in Exodus 32 and before. If you look at, if you still have the teaching text in front of you, and you go a few pages back to Exodus chapter 32, verse 34 and 35, listen to what God says. So again, so at the end of everything he said, he got angry, he forgave them. So have a look at Exodus 32, verse 34 and 35. So he says, now go and lead the people to the place I spoke of, my angel will go before you. Then he says, however, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for this sin. Next verse, and the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf that Aaron made. So church, you know we often joke and talk about the Old Testament God and the New Testament God and, and, and. If God has not disciplined us, let's not be fooled to thinking we want to be disciplined. Whatever that looks like. I don't know what that looks like. God is king. God is Lord giver. God is judge. He will decide. There's a scripture that says, for vengeance belongs to the Lord. So don't take revenge, because vengeance belongs to the Lord. As a word of encouragement, when we see the wicked around us, Doing that which is wicked. And we are doing that which is God and that which is righteous. It's not our place to say, God, smite them, strike them. Why are you not acting? He's God. He's king. He's judge. Let it go. Focus on you. That's just as a word of encouragement. For there are some of us who do get frustrated and we do get bogged down. Okay, I promise I'm closing. Okay, let me note this actually. So you'll see in verse 7, it says, He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So that's a sermon in and of itself. Um, but I, I felt it was important to address some of the misconceptions we can have with this verse. So oftentimes, in the church and outside the church, we, we have this theology that says we've received or we've experienced generational curses. It comes typically from the scripture. 
In Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6, it speaks about the same thing. Um, but when we look at God holistically, it helps us recognize that, no, 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 God isn't a God who will pass down judgment for everyone to everyone based on what a few have done. So even theologically, when we talk about the fact that Adam was the first Adam, the first man in sin, and all of us sin, God will always hold each of us accountable for our own actions. So theologically, it's important to understand. Right? There are a few verses that I want to read then that help us understand it. I'm going to go through this quickly. Um, but these will help us understand this, this, this teaching around these scriptures. So the first of which is Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, it says, The soul who sins is the one who will die. The son will not share the guilt of the father, nor will the father share the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous man will be credited to him, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against him. Ezekiel 18, 20, right? Another one we see in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 16, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for their own sin. As we think about the verses we looked at earlier that talk about the fact that we will account before God, theologically, as we look through the scriptures, there's more that speaks to the fact that each one will account for each of their actions. Where this generational component comes in, where scholars will say this is our understanding, if you think about a family where a son sees their father drinking and being physically abusive to, them, to, their, to their spouse or to them, when they get into the same context, they're more likely to also take on that which they learned and that which they were taught and that which they were exposed to. You think about a hateful family. So if a family spews hate, division, and a child is raised in that environment, they're more likely to keep going with it. You think about families where you talk about family businesses, where a child will very likely end up in the direction that their parents were in, because maybe societally that's what's done. So we do see that the way God has structured the earth, they're they generally natural consequences to what happens. If a parent was drinking when their child, when they were pregnant with their child, they will be natural things that affect the child because of the decision of the parents. It's less to say that God is, is, is punishing per se, but it's that the way society is structured, there are those that come being in a similar environment. The same thing can be said about faithfulness, love, and godliness. So, so, again, it's one of those where scholars have different views, but one of the areas that they look at is we see that, and even with the, with, with this, with this, the, the, the Israelites in Exodus 32, we see that they perpetuated and they kept doing what previous generations have done, and that is what God had disciplined them for. They kept worshipping the gods, the other gods outside of God, which they had seen from where they were enslaved, and they kept so I felt it was important for us just to address that real quick. Again, it's a sermon, it's a whole series, we don't have time, but I felt as we read it, it was important to get scriptures that speak to that, and then understanding a bit better the content. So we end with this church. It's 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, we're officially done. Why does God punish and discipline? We can answer that. We saw that in Hebrews 12. He loves us, so he disciplines and punishes us. Another thing I want to highlight is the fact that because, as our first point said, he's king, lord, giver, and judge, he has to hold himself to the role he has given himself. We're going to show Psalm 89 verse 14 real quick. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. Love and faithfulness go before him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. Love and faithfulness go before him. So what we understand with that is, literally the foundation of who God is as a judge is to be righteous and just. He's just because he's righteous, he's holy, he does not tolerate sin. So whether he likes it or not, he must always take action against sin. He must always ensure that the guilty are punished. Because it's who he is. He can't go against his own character. Romans 3.23, this is where we'll end. 
the last verse I'm going to be showing this. This is the theological home we understand in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in light of everything that we've said. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Another version says a substitutionary atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness. Another version says to demonstrate His justice. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just, and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. It's a lot, but theologically it's rich. This is a word of encouragement that we will get into the week with. Understanding that Jesus had to come in our place because we were found guilty before God. We had broken the commands of God through sin separating us from God. So in a court of law, God was sitting as judge, ready to rule, as we speak figuratively, for all of us. And Jesus, it's almost like he individually stood up and said, I'll take their sin on my shoulders. I'll suffer the consequences. So we talk, when we talk about the cross, symbolically, Jesus took the punishment that we were supposed to have experienced. God is judge, and He will not leave the guilty unpunished. Praise be to Jesus that He has stood out. So then in, later in this verse of course, so, so what do we do with the Lord? Do we ignore the law? And then Paul says, no way. Right? The, Jesus says the law is fulfilled in him. He's not here to abolish the law. So, in John 14, 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And so, we recognize that we will still account that the hope we have is that we serve the gracious loving God. And in our relationship with Jesus, who, who took our punishment, because we were all guilty. The reason I asked that first question was too short, is that we're all, we're all guilty in one way or another. We take Christ, and then daily, we obey the commands. Because even though that Christ did die for us, the Bible talks about a day of judgment, the final day of judgment. When we will find ourselves before our God, before our Creator, and we will account. May we be found righteous and just on that day. Let me pray for us, church. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day and we thank you. We thank you that even though today is one of those where it's a, it's a tough word, it's a tough message for you, we were reminded that you're a gracious God, that you're a loving God. We're reminded that everything you do, though painful and as painful as it can be, it's rooted and grounded in love. As a parent disciplines their child because they love them, Remind us daily, Lord, that you, you love us. And everything you do stems from that love. Bless each one of us here this morning, Lord Jesus. Bless each family that is represented here, Heavenly Father. You know what everyone is going through. Meet them where they are, Lord Jesus. And may we experience your gracious and loving character. Your character as Yahweh, our gracious judge on a daily basis. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people say,